मान्य सदस्य ने बैठा हुआ अब ठीक है ना आपको थोड़ी पैरवी के लिए कहा मान्य सदस्य की नहीं गलत आप सीनियर मंत्री ऐसे मत कीजिए श्री गौरव गोगे जी थैंक यू स्पीकर सर I rise to speak on the uh, finance bill 2022 which is a money bill and in it there are sections related to direct tax indirect tax uh, custom custom duty and but before i raise this issue so we must understand the context in which we are today today because of repeated covid induced lockdowns the country is recovering but the recovery is inequal or unequal the gap between the poor and the rich have only increased the gap between the haves and the have nots have increased the government promised a v shaped recovery but instead we are seeing a k shaped recovery and this problem is extremely disappointing and is of extreme concern because already we had seen that the inequality in this country is increasing now today the top 10% earn 20 times more than the bottom 50% while the top 10% and the top 1% hold respectively 57% that this government is giving to the people of india there is record unemployment please don't worry our supreme leader is there please honorable prices are rising jingoism is the only antidote that this government is offering to the poor whether there is record unemployment whether there is high inequality whether there is inflation people are expected to believe put all their faith in the leader despite the fact that their backs are crumbling under this economic pressure we just mentioned earlier that fuel prices are being increased for the third time in one week and this is a country which has just emerged out of a lockdown a third lockdown they need the chance to breathe they need their chance to conduct their businesses in a free and fair atmosphere not always under the burden of high inflation and high fuel prices and it is sir a bit ironic as to the answer that this government or its ecosystem or its spokespersons are giving on fuel prices they are saying that the fuel prices are had to happen are bound to happen why because there is a conflict in ukraine so i remember prime minister modi ji speaking in parliament on his last uh, during the last speech he made and in that sir there was a point and i was listening to him very carefully he referred to pandit nehru and he referred to pandit nehru saying that can you imagine that pandit nehru once blamed an international conflict happening in different part of the world for the economic problems of india and he smirked when he made that remark now today what is happening now today isn't prime minister modi making the same argument that because of ukraine we have to no choice but to increase the fuel prices but the counter is there are two counters that if for 137 days the ukraine conflict did not happen last week or did not happen 3 days ago the ukraine us russia european conflict has been going on since december Russian troops were on the border of Ukraine since this December. It's been more than a month since military escalation has happened. For one month, they could keep their prices stable. What has changed now? What has changed? That for one last month since the beginning of the conflict, since the beginning of the Russian troops being on the border, to the beginning of the bombardment, to the Ukrainian refugees flying, to, uh, fleeing to different parts of Europe. That time, you could not, you you did not increase the prices. Why now? just because elections are over that's how you repay the people who put their faith on you i i congratulate you congratulate you on your stupendous victory but that doesn't mean that you take people's vote for granted that doesn't mean that you get a remit to put to continuously put more and more burden on the poor on the middle class on the unemployed so therefore i feel 
that while we talk about the finance bill and the taxes, they're extremely important, we must talk about this context. Now, I don't want to be only critical of this government. There are certain measures in the finance bill which we welcome. Now, they have given a tax exemption for amounts related to COVID-19 and medical treatment. We welcome that. They have also, they have said that there's going to be illegal, they have identified under Section 37 that the IT Act allows for certain expenditure which is incurred for the purposes of business, except where the expenditure is incurred for purposes that qualifies as an offense or is prohibited by law. Now, in this finance bill, they have ensured that gifts and expenditure incurred on travel, hospitality, and conferences, they will no longer be exempt. They will also will be taxed. And that's a welcome step I, that I, I feel the government is doing. There might be resistance from the pharmaceutical industry, but I hope that the government, in its sagacity, will manage to tackle with the pharmaceutical industry because we all know, sir, there is a there is lot of examples in the world that how big pharma companies push certain procedures, push certain medicines through doctors, and in the end, the financial burden comes on the poor. So therefore, there's enough evidence, and I welcome this step. At the same time, sir, there are certain steps which need more clarity. Now, on virtual digital assets, they have introduced a tax of 30%. At the same time, sir, this, while this measure is intended to disincentivize, discourage people trading or occupying or holding cryptocurrencies or NFTs, the government still is sending out mixed signals. And the government should send out a very clear signal. What A, how are you going to define crypto? Is it an asset? Is it a currency? Is it a something that can be speculative? We are waiting for the legislation and for the clarity to come. And why it is important for the clarity to come sooner rather than later? Because so many people in India are in, in trading in cryptocurrencies. So many exchanges have been set up. And so normally, normally when there is an IT technology-based change that takes place, we welcome it. And Indians are the first to welcome. Indians are the first to adopt it and innovate it and put an Indian context to it. And therefore, already there are record volumes of crypto-based transactions. Already a lot of young IT engineers are involved in this. But the government, while in putting a 30% tax, while they're talking, they're coming out with further and further clarification that it can't be offset, the losses cannot uh, be offset. But I appeal to the government to have two approaches in mind. One approach should be that if you want to treat crypto as a sin, and you want to have a high tax on it, and you want to eventually ban it, then be specific and have that. But keep, bear in mind that a lot of people would indulge in crypto and indulge in these operations in the dark net, and all of these operations will go oh, under. You are supporting cryptocurrency. No, no, I'm, saying I have the I'm asking the government to be clear, to have a clear approach. Clarity. Have clarity. Okay. And I'm asking for a policy to come out sooner rather than later. And secondly, I'm asking, sir, at the same time, they, I hope the government doesn't change its mind because there are parts of this world. I'm just outlining the complexity of the issue because there are parts of the world, there are even countries which are take, adopted crypto as officially. Different countries have come out with regulations. Japan has one set of regulations. America has another set of regulations. So the government needs to have two approaches. One, if there is a ban, what is going to be your approach so that crypto doesn't become for an, as the route for money laundering or illicit activities or drugs or crime? B, if they do want to regulate it, then what are the learnings, lessons that we can learn from America and Japan from elsewhere? But 
that is, I rest it over here. But nonetheless, sir, point being, crypto is a risk at this moment. Is a risk. And then crypto is not the only risk that is in today's market. Sir, the stock market, sir, if you would see, there over the last two years, especially during pandemic, there have been a lot of new investors in the stock market. Many say that while for people who are sitting in their homes for two years, as a way to occupy themselves, as a way to counter the, uh, the, the low interest rates from banks, a lot of young people, a lot of people, middle class people, a lot of women, elderly people have rushed into the stock market. Now the stock market is, is not just a, is not, is, is, is not simple. It's complicated. It has its own rules. It has own laws and principles. And the government must be concerned because right now there are so many commercials on YouTube, people selling their advice and encouraging people to invest in the stock market. And there are a lot of new in investors. Now that could be another bubble. That could be another bubble that is waiting to, to burst. And therefore I, I request the government to be also taken to account of this matter. There is, all, I already mentioned inequality, I already mentioned crypto, I already mentioned the stock market. What is also happening, sir, that we are seeing that our, one of the aims of this government, and any government, is to widen the tax base. We want more and more people to pay their taxes, and they have certain clarifications which have come. There are certain clarifications which have come on direct tax, on AOPs and other things. But what we are also seeing, sir, is an exodus of high net individuals. Now, we know that most of the income that comes under income tax comes from high net individuals. But what is happening, sir? We are seeing that since 2019, 7,000 high net worth individuals have left the country. A report says that $23,000 millionaires have left India between 2014 and 18. Now, we should be worried, sir. What is this ecosystem in India that is pushing some of our most highest earners, most productive people who are heads of big enterprises, the heads of big business? Why are they leaving the country? What is it in the ecosystem? Some have voiced that it is because of the fear that they feel. Some have voiced because it is of the unfair pressure that comes from various arms of this government. But I hope that this government seriously introspects because that is not the reputation we want. We want that whoever you are, you might be a high net worth individual, you might be a salaried class, you will not be unduly harassed by the government. You will not be unduly pressurized by any extension of our government, and I hope that they would take into account. They would also take into account, sir, that now with Ukraine and inflation assumed to rise at 7%, various rating agencies are going to have brought down their growth outlook. So what is their plan now? The government should come up with a clear white paper as to how they managed to ensure that our fiscal fundamentals, our financial fundamentals remain stable, that clarity must come out. Because it seems that every month, because of certain external factors, our growth outlook keeps changing and the government sometimes, I can say, is caught on its back foot. This government in its taxation bill, this finance bill has also got some sector-specific amendments. They've got amendments on handicrafts, apparel, leather, electronics, they've reduced the import duties for mobile phones, they've got uh, import duties being reduced on certain chemicals such as sodium cyanide, methyl alcohol, acetic acid. They've also raised the customs duty on umbrellas to 20%, and they're also revising their anti-dumping duties on steel, considering the high cost of steel. So just on steel, sir, because it's such an important sector, I do hope that the Honorable Finance Minister, in her reply, would specifically state that whether this anti-dumping duty which is being revoked, whether that's a temporary measure or it's a permanent measure. 
because the prices of commodities and especially that of steel, which are though nonetheless high, but at some point are likely to come down as well. But if you keep having an unpredictable flip-flop policy on commodity by commodity, that sends out a very wrong signal. Sir, so gems and jewellery, the customs duty has also been reduced to 5%. And now we, on fuel, they, they are again, they want to encourage blended fuel and therefore they are imposing an excise duty of 2 rupees per litre on unblended fuel. Now, sir, this is an important matter. I understand that why that by introducing blended fuel, they want to re kind of, ov overall, they want to reduce their expenditure. But this is not the way to do it, sir. This kind of tax that you're doing, that you're, this kind of instrument, that if you want to encourage blended fuel, you will make unblended fuel. That does not work, sir. You have to create the ecosystem. Understand, talk to the OMCs, talk to the petrochemicals, talk to the retail outlets, talk to the pump outlets. There's a lot of resistance because the supply chain has to be set up. Remember, sir, what happened with GST. A hasty implementation, not taking into account the ecosystem, not orienting them, did more damage than benefit. And similarly, I advise this government, as they're pushing for blended fuel, I, I would ask this government to reduce, to take back this excise duty of two rupees per litre on unblended fuel. Sir, this government has also brought out uh, something on the SEZs, and I hope this government would give us more details on that. On GSTs, the position of our states is extremely doubtful and, and extremely vulnerable. They rely a lot on the GST compensation. And the timing of GST compensation has been extremely poor. It is completely at the hands of the central government. They release it when it suits them, but that does not suit the state government. State governments have to pay salaries. State governments have to fund their social welfare schemes. State governments have to put in money for development. Now, on this GST, they will say it's the GST council. But, sir, I would request this government, there have been enough, both within and outside. State governments have continuously raised their views that the GST compensation is not released adequately, not released on time. And also, sir, the, under the Act, the tenure for GST compensation is coming to an end. So my request to this government is that you have extended the exemptions under this bill to startups. You have, you have extended the exemptions given to companies for manufacturing by one more year. I would request this government to again extend the tenure for GST compensation and extend it by uh, a year or not, or by, by two years, take into account the GST Thank council. You. Yes, sir. I'll come to an answer. I mean, I'll, I'll conclude sh shortly. There are also there are some exemptions which have been come on the International Financial Services Center. The income of non-resident from offshore derivative instruments, income from over-the-counter derivatives. Frankly speaking, sir, the IFC International Financial Services Center seems to be like a white elephant. This government is trying to revive it, trying to push various things in order to like to, to, uh, to make it alive. It's like giving those electric shocks to a patient that is already on its last breath and a patient that is already on the last leg. You have done since 2014 so many, come out with so many initi initiatives to push the IFC. But what has happened? Nothing. So why didn't you take the right lesson from it and instead of pushing more initiatives, understand that there could be other locations in India that are much more suitable for the International Financial Services Center. I am not asking you to shut it down, but I am asking you to think broadly and have an open mind. Think about the West, think about South of India, think about the East, whether it's Calcutta, Bombay, Bangalore, or if you even want to have it in, in the Northeast, which has a, such a long international boundary. Thank you. Be, be, more, be more broad in your outlook. So again, I don't, I don't want to always criticize this government, we must put on record things that they have done well and we appreciate. I've already talked about how COVID-related payments have been exempt. Yes. Again, they've come up with the insurance scheme payments for persons with disability. We welcome that. And, sir, there are two things I want specific if the minister could give us the details. So, on GST, sir, we must, time has also come to evaluate the GST. And if, does the government have data 
that pre gst what was the volume of income they were collecting as part of indirect taxes and compare that with the post gst era what is the volume of uh, revenue collected from indirect taxes is it same has it decreased or has it increased that they should talk about secondly sir corporate tax was reduced from 30% to 25% no doubt it had a hit on our revenue but they but the government's argument was that this will lead to more corporates investing which will therefore lead to more jobs has this government done any study that while the middle class of india who continuously votes and supports the this government have got no relief corporates have got a relief of 5% and on the basis that they would invest more they would put in more factories they would employ more has that argument worked out do they have any study showing that more investment and more jobs have been yes. created yes go ahead ji please so with that sir i would not want to take too much of your time i've talked about direct tax i've talked about indirect tax corporate gst scz the customs so there are certain suggestions which have also come from chartered accounting various agencies i hope they will take into account but at the at the same time sir let me go back to where i started from sir fiscally we are not in a good position our states are in debt our nation is in debt borrowings have increased most of the payments are going into borrowings and this government is through its policies are pushing us further into debt this is not a good sign already there are a lot of other vulnerabilities that i talked about like crypto like the new, uh, new investors and uh, less informed investors in the stock market the debt and the fiscal position of our states is very important states uh, i am i am i am sorry to say have no other option but they are playing with excise based income they are either extending the wine liquor shops the timings of wine liquor shops and opening from the beginning or they are trying to increase their taxes because states all the power of the state the sovereign power of states to raise revenue has gone into the gst so fiscally sir we are in a very bad position our hands are constrained time has come sir that this government instead of using external factors to justify its moderate conservative stance uses the same risk to come up with a progressive and strong policy that is what the upa government has done on various occasions when the 2008 global financial crisis hit our growth did not take a hit like other countries did and our employment was not as bad as it is now similarly in 1991 come the moment of crisis the gun government under under our finance minister dr manmohan singh prime minister pv narsimha rao and all the others came together to give a new outlook an economic outlook a new economic vision for our country which has given us a new middle class and the economic muscle to call ourselves as an power as an asian power Thank therefore you. i re request this government to emulate the upa and use this moment of difficulty and crisis to have a bold vision and stop being cautious thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you sir nishri nishikant dubey ji